So we'll resume our uh, meeting after our luncheon recess, and I would like to call upon President Riley. Thank you, President Brett. Uh, we'll move now to the second major topic for our uh, special one-day meeting, which is professional doctorates in our system. Uh, within the last three years, this board has authorized the impl implementation of three professional practice doctorates, all of those in health-related fields. Uh, one of them at a doctoral institution, the other two as collaborations between a doctoral institution and a comprehensive university. And several others are expected to come before the board within the next year. So uh, a little like the previous discussion where it was a broad-ranging discussion of a big issue for us without any decision needing to be made. That's true here, too. This is a, a big issue without a decision to be made today. But just like with compensation, where we have an immediate pay plan decision, at least in December, uh, we know there will be some more of these doctorates coming forward for you to consider in the near future. So this is not just a theoretical discussion. Uh, these new degrees, commonly referred to as clinical doctorates, professional doctorates, or professional practice doctorates, are largely uh, mounted in response to uh, market demand. They've been created as a result of several factors out there in the market, broadly speaking. One of those is licensure requirements, uh, in increasing, changing professional licensure requirements. Uh, another is added requirements uh, uh, for accreditation in specific fields, and this board has talked off and on in the past about <coughs> accreditation issues. Uh, and a third is additional disciplinary and practice depth needed in some professions to respond to emerging technologies to a, a growing uh, 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 content area and knowledge base. Uh, so these professional doctorates we think now here, certainly nationally too, are gaining importance uh, in, the, in our program array uh, and they are at, uh, in, in uh, research and comprehensive university program arrays across the country. At the same time, I think it's fair to say that there is uh, something of a lack of consensus on the definition, purpose, quality, rigor of many professional doctorates. And I think you saw in the materials uh, that we prepared for you in advance of the meeting that uh, uh, there are, there's some noise uh, among those who categorize and use these about whether, for instance, they're research doctorates or practical doctorates or some combination of, of the two. Uh, some of the questions I think we need to address are uh, the role of professional doctorates in our program array in the UW system, uh, their value, necessity to uh, our students, uh, the state's need for additional uh, degrees at this level given uh, its professional mix, uh, and the capacity issues generated for our institutions by uh, considering and then <coughs> you approve them actually implementing these degree programs. There are, under that rubric, there are issues of mission alignment across the system, of quality, of curricula, of faculty, of resources, of access, of affordability. So um, I think this will be an interesting uh, discussion. I think the materials that Rebecca and her <coughs> colleagues prepared uh, for you to, to read before the meeting were very well done and gave you kind of a very nice framework context and I think Rebecca will pick up from there with some more background information and then we'll have a discussion. So Rebecca. Thank you. So <clears throat> Kevin has kind of given you a bit of an introduction about why we are talking about professional doctorates today. I think what we want to do is to try to give you some background for the policy and administrative decisions that are facing us or will be facing us if we go to, as we go down this path, some context and definitions for the discussion. As Kevin said, there's a number of practical issues that are related to this mission alignment, program array, the opportunity for growth, cost effectiveness, and there's some policy questions with specific reference to the comprehensives and the role that our comprehensive institutions might play in the development of professional doctorates um, for our state. We're seeing transitions in professional education across the country, um, as Kevin and Kevin has already um, lined out some of these for you, so I'll just go past that so, and give you some definitions. Here's a doc, the doctor's degree definition um, for a research or scholarship doctoral degree. 
We have the vast majority of the 134 doctoral programs that we have in the UW system fall within this category. It requires a dissertation based on original research. Um, these are offered at UW-Madison and UW-Milwaukee, and here are just a few examples. The PhD in all of its variations falls clearly in this category, as do <coughs> other um, research-based doctorates in other fields. Um, the professional practice de degree has also been around for a long time, um, and it's currently offered um, at UW-Madison, UW-Milwaukee, and in two campuses, in two instances at UW comprehensive institutions in collaboration with Madison or Milwaukee. And so the JD, the, the medical degree, the dental degree, and a number of others fall within this category. The doctor, um, and then there's one doctoral degree that, that, that our field is, is now kind of thinking falls in both of these categories, and that is the EDD, or the Doctor of Education. Um, there, there's, this is one that blurs the distinction. It does require dissertation research, but also is often much more applied in nature than the, the traditional PhD. In, it has increasing relevance to leadership roles in public education, so there's a growing workforce demand in some arenas for this degree. And it's going, undergoing a national reevaluation. There's a discussion going on about how, how does the EDD compare to the PhD in education, which is the degree that we have in our state. We do not have any, any offering of the EDD at this point. Professional doctors require at least a bachelor's degree for entry, often in a related field. It includes applied or clinical research and, and, and provides a preparation or a body of knowledge needed for professional practice in a specific field. And as Kevin mentioned, is related often to issues of licensure and, and accreditation. And so here's the history. Um, recently, you have authorized the implementation of three professional practice degrees, all in health-related fields. Two of these are consortial or collaborative degrees between UW institutions, in one case, um, Madison and Stevens Point, in another case, Milwaukee and La Crosse. There's one freestanding program at the Madison campus that would fall in this particular arena. Here's a list of the 10 <laughs> professional doctorates across our system. The first four are well established nationally and have been in our system for a long time. Um, others reflect recent developments in health related fields. And I should point out again that comprehensive institutions in our state at this point are involved only in collaborative degree programs. Some recent, recent um, some context, national context um, recently. Over the last um, 10 years or so, the changes in necessary competencies required degree levels be raised. This is happening in many of the clinical fields. There's been a disciplinary reassessment of, of degree requirements, and there's been selective authority for comprehensive institutions nationally to develop professional doctorates in physical therapy, audiology, nursing, and education at a number of our peer institutions. Here's a quick scan of some of our of systems that we look to as peer systems. Um, you'll note here that there's a variation in approach. Offerings for professional doctorates are, are still predominantly at research institutions, but the Minnesota State College System, um, College and University System, MinSKU, does have comprehensive institutions offering selected applied doctorates, and the um, most of the professional doctorates in the University of Minnesota system are offered primarily at the flagship institution, but the Duluth campus also does now offer at least, I think, one or two professional doctorates. In California, um, some of you may know California has long had a master plan that has laid out very specific um, guidelines for what degrees can be offered by which, which systems and the University of California system is charged by the state's master plan as being the only public institution responsible for awarding doctoral degrees. The California State University system has recently challenged this in the legislature and they are, those conversations are ongoing. 
They have limited professional doctorates now that are offered collaboratively between the two systems. Right now, that is only the um, EDD, the education degree, but the Cal State system is, is actively pursuing an expansion of their authority to offer professional doctorates in that state with their legislature. I thought at this point it might be helpful for you to get a little bit of perspective from two of our comprehensive um, campus chancellors who have been thinking about this for a long time. And um, I thought I'd let Brian um, Levinstan-Kevich go first, and then we'll hear from Rick Wells. There um, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for, for the opportunity to discuss this. We've been waiting to discuss this topic for quite some time. Um, I'd like to uh, focus on uh, there it is. I'd like to focus on uh, three or four areas. First of all, the type of institution and the type of degree and the match or mismatch that that creates. Um, demand questions, which are always of concern when we talk about any kind of degree program. Um, the role of the University of Wisconsin, and um, really it's, it's the role of to what extent are we bound by something that happened in 1972, 36 years later. And uh, institutional sustainability uh, from a variety of perspectives. Uh, these degrees, if you look at the descriptions and if you've ever been involved in any of them, are fundamentally, primarily, classroom-based degrees. And we are primarily classroom and teaching-based institutions. Um, these degrees do not require the level of one-on-one -on -one mentoring and graduate, uh, graduate student supervision uh, of research that is the case in PhD programs. Um, and, and actually, are, although they were listed as high cost, uh, there's a reference to high cost professional doctorates. There are some of those. There are some of them that are actually not high cost. And can be very efficiently offered by uh, any number of institutions. Um, so I think that the kind of degree it is fits in nicely with the um, kind of work that we do at the comprehensive institution. Um, let me try to be, as, as Rick said earlier, brief, but it's going to be hard. Um, <laughs> The other, the other nature of, of these degrees is that they are very experiential and applied. They best fit working professionals, people who are already working in their fields. And uh, those are people who are not mobile, who cannot pick up and spend six, seven years in a PhD program at a distant location. Um, and, and oftentimes uh, of an age group that, that will expect at least some face-to-face -face and not entirely uh, online interaction with uh, with their with their academic program. We we all pride ourselves on the connection of theory and practice in the comprehensive. This is uh, the engaged university. It's what we, what we do what we do service learning for. It's it's why we have internships and why we uh, connect students to their communities is to uh, engage them with applied learning. And so again, this this fits with exactly the kind of mission we all have. Demand. Uh, there are tremendous needs of professionals. I had uh, uh, certainly, if we look at the geographic distribution of doctoral programs in the state, uh, it stops at Madison going west. <coughs> you go north to uh, Stevens and get the audiology. Now we have the DPT in the south, and uh, what's the south to us at least? And <laughs> 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 but the I 94 corridor really has, has no option. So we have people driving up to Duluth, which actually offers a PhD, as well as the MD. Um, and Julius tells me the MD as well. Um, or over to Minneapolis, which is 90 minutes uh, from us. So we have staff work all day, get the car, drive over for evening classes, and come back and then try to manage their graduate program. <coughs> Um, a simple conversation I had with uh, a former president of uh, a technical college that abuts my campus uh, said, said, if you had an ED program, we'd fill it with just our faculty. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true of, of many of our institutions where we need to elevate uh, nursing, for example, elevate the qualifications of our faculty to a doctoral level. The same crisis <coughs> in the business. We have seven vacancies in our nursing faculty positions right now, and we are in constant search mode. Uh, 
so, so having the DNP in the state is going to help that tremendously. And again, this is a way to grow our faculty who are turning, who then turn into teaching faculty, not necessarily research faculty, but turn into teaching faculty to populate the comprehensive universities. Um, we're having this discussion because we go back to a 1972 document that says that the research universities will offer the doctoral degrees, and a vague statement in the mission statement about the comprehensives that talk about graduate programs. Uh, so I think the question I have is, this is a 36-year-old document. A lot has changed over the years. A lot has changed in the ability to deliver educational programs. And um, I think to hold ourselves to a 1972 agreement without actually questioning it, questioning it in, great, uh, in great depth would be, uh, would be akin to uh, the excuse I hear quite often at, at my own and many other campuses, well, we've always done it that way. So how can we change? Uh, institutional sustainability, and um, my provost is here, my dean of graduate <coughs> studies, know that I see uh, a significant role in the future of UW-Eau Claire for selected graduate programs. And I, it, it seems to me that many of them are going to, some of them are going to have to be at this, this professional doctoral level. Um, first of all, Sustaining an institution means maintaining enrollment strength. If you don't maintain enrollment strength, the quality of your students declines, or the revenue you're bringing in from tuition declines, and the quality of everything then declines because you don't have the revenue to afford your programs. Uh, we know we're facing some change demographics over the next eight to 10 years. We've had presentations here about those demographics. It's an older potential student body that we're trying to serve. <coughs> Many of those students already have bachelor's degrees and are looking to extend their education into professional areas. Um, again, if you look geographically, we don't have any right in our region to serve a, a growing population. Uh, you take the counties from Eau Claire all the way to the Minnesota border, and uh, you have a, a St. Croix County, uh, fastest growing county in the state. At least that's the last I heard. Um, so the demographics sort of indicate we need to serve not only traditional students, but adult students, both at the baccalaureate level and where their educational needs are. And many of them are going to be in these uh, professional areas. Um, there, is a there are a number of financial issues involved in this. Um, one is uh, certainly the kind of cross-subsidization we do with every academic program. Um, ask any faculty member in humanities or social sciences and they will graphically describe the cross-subsidization that their large class does for a small professional program. Um, there are programs, and I've had experiences with them at other institutions, that you can grow at the graduate level, at the professional doctoral level, that can generate revenue for the institution and cross-subsidize some of our other activities at the undergraduate level, and at the same time enhance in many ways the undergraduate experience of students in <coughs> programs leading up to that degree. Um, we have to be careful with that, but any new degree program we bring to you is already vetted pretty carefully in terms of demand and in terms of the business plan. How are you going to pay for this? So um, I, I don't think we should begin with the assumption that comprehensive institutions would go off and do something contrary to their own financial self-interest. I think that would be suicidal for us to do. Um, program array, again, sustainability of the institution is how do you position your institution to maintain enrollment strength, to maintain the reputation that many generations have built before us, and, uh, and to continue to enhance that, that reputation for the graduates who hold our degrees. Um, program array, we're in competition not just with other UW institutions, and there is competition. Uh, we're in competition with many private institutions. Uh, if, we, if we can't compete, if we can't respond to demand by growing programs uh, like these, uh, those will be taken up by private institutions because they see the financial benefit of doing some of these programs. And I think that the obverse of that is the pricing, and there's got to be some some discussion around pricing of these programs because if it is a more expensive program, you ought to be able to price it based on the cost of delivery as opposed to an arbitrary uh, 
sort of flat tuition rate. Um, cut back on some of these here. Uh, you know, I think I think there are, there are uh, clearly I'm, I'm a strong proponent of, of, of comprehensive institutions. I, I'm doing uh, doctoral degrees in, of these types. Uh, I looked at uh, Carnegie classifications and just very quickly pulled up institutions uh, that offer one or a couple of doctorates, professional doctorates, only non-PhDs that we would call comprehensives. I hit 28 states that already allow their comprehensives to offer these degrees. Maryland has four, four institutions. Um, Cal State, uh, the, the Rebecca's counterpart, is a very good friend of mine, one of my mentors, um, has, has actually, they've gotten some institutions now have independent authority to offer the EdD. Uh, they tried a joint program with UC, with the University of California schools. Uh, that was insisted on by the University of California, and they only found that it was uh, sort of preemptive <laughs> measure by the University of California. They didn't really want to offer the EdD, but they didn't want the other schools to offer them independently. So now they have broken off some of the institutions on an experimental basis to see if that will work there. Um, so a number of states have done this, including our neighboring states, uh, Illinois, Indiana, uh, Michigan, and Minnesota all offer mostly EDDs. I'll admit that. They're mostly education doctorates uh, in a variety of areas, leadership curriculum and instruction. Um, but also the DPTs and the DNPs and the DBAs as well. So um, a lot more to say probably in a minute, but I'll let Rick uh, go. Do we have questions now? Okay, whoops. Rick will be great. <laughs> I just told me very brief. <laughs> okay, I'll try. Um, I'm, I'm just going to add on, on some of the things Brian mentioned. I thought it would be helpful if I tell you a little bit about my um, experience as provost at Indiana State University for seven years. Indiana State University is much like UW Oshkosh in size, tradition, and founding. But uh, when I arrived there, we had uh, eight doctoral programs. And we actually added a ninth one while I was there. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Half of those doctoral programs would be what one would call PhD programs, you know, pretty much driven by uh, theory driven basic research and uh, like biology and uh, geography and things of that sort. And the other half were what we're calling here professional doctorates or practice doctorates, like the PsyD and clinical, the like EDD. We also had a PhD program in education uh, there as well. And um, and we added a PhD, the first one in the country, in technology management, and, and actually Stout was part of that. It was a consortium. It was a degree eventually award, awarded by Indiana State in consortium with nine institutions across the country. It was a huge fight um, with uh, Purdue and IU opposing it, uh, but we won. Uh, because we had Stout as a partner. Right? <laughs> now they're not involved in it anymore. <laughs> But thanks for helping us out. We appreciate it. So, um, so part of the interesting thing on that, and then, then I'll get back to the, the, the major point about professional doctorates at mostly comprehensive campuses. In that discussion and debate about whether there should be a PhD in technology management, was the issue of whether or not there was enough minimal knowledge as opposed to borrowed knowledge in that discipline. It's, it's kind of the argument about when we started offering PhDs in engineering. They had to fight like crazy to get that approved as well. So we had to demonstrate that there that we were we had enough minimal knowledge that evolved in technology management, independent of borrowed knowledge, like borrowed methodologies, uh, borrowed theories, uh, you know, from other fields. That this was an independent enough field that needed to advance itself for further uh, uh, research and knowledge uh, for, for, for the area of technology management. Um, uh, but when you look at, at, at this, and having been in an institution that had only four doctoral programs in the, in the PhD uh, uh, research-like uh, degrees, um, and then the four that were uh, uh, applied in nature or professional in nature, the problem with that on, the, on having in an institution like Indiana State uh, a PhD, a research PhD, is that you're much more dependent upon having strength at the master's and or doctoral level in your sister disciplines. And so we had, for example, a PhD in biology, but we didn't have that in the master's program in chemistry. 
So you always are concerned about the quality of being able to have a high quality PhD, research PhD if you, if you don't have enough sister disciplines that are at that level uh, to support that kind of a degree. So it, it's probably, not probably, it's not advisable to launch those types of PhD programs in comprehensive institutions. On the other hand, the, the kind of degrees that we're talking about, the professional, the applied degrees, they're not as dependent on the sister disciplines uh, to support that kind of degree. Now, make no mistake about it, there's research that's necessary in those. They just tend to be more uh, theory-driven, applied-like research. And that's why you get in this issue about the EDD or the PhD in education. You know, they'll argue they require dissertations and, uh, and, and things of that sort. But it really is an application uh, focus to advance the application of the knowledge in a the, in the profession or a set of related professions. Uh, uh, so, so that's that's uh, where you should be comfortable, I think, with institutions like we have here uh, in Wisconsin that they can handle that type of doctoral <coughs> preparation, particularly because it, it comes of us anyway. I mean, we talk about nursing and education. You know, they used to call our kind of institutions where you got the lesser profession degree. You know, uh, nice language for us: uh, teachers, nurses, uh, social workers, and things of that sort. Well, they're clearly not lesser professions. But there are the places where you should probably expect more advanced level education at the doctoral level, like the nurse, uh, the doctor of nurse practice, to be there. Because there's a tradition there, there's strength there, we know what we're doing. Um, and I guess the final uh, uh, point that, that I would make is, uh, as I think a number of you know, I'm a big believer in collaboration. One of the reasons we got the PhD in technology management through, we were collaborating. It's not easy. It, it's, it's still difficult running a, a collaborative program across two or more institutions. Uh, but there's huge advantages because what it does, it gives you bigger faculty. So you have more faculty strength, and therefore you're going to have a better program. The other thing, uh, it's good to do collaboration as much as you can with this kind of program, uh, is it allows you to give more convenience to the, the students in it. You know, because in this case, the students in a, in a, in a doctorate, uh, a practice doctorate, are typically older and busy. So you've got to be able to more conveniently deliver the degree program, the opportunity, access to faculty, so they can get courses from any one of a number of different, different institutions and be able to have that in a degree program. You're going to do a better job servicing your needs. So that's what I would add to it. Thank you. So the policy questions, and I'm going to pose a number of questions for you here, and then I'm going to sit down and let you talk about them. Um, but the first question really is, you know, what is the appropriate role of the UW system's comprehensive institutions in providing professional doctorate education? And I think you've just heard from two of our chancellors on that topic. Within that, is the offering of professional doctorates within the mission of the comprehensive institutions? And this material was in your summaries, but let me read you the actual core mission statements that were developed at Merger, because I think it's important for you to have this context. The doctoral cult cluster, that's Madison, Milwaukee, says offer degree programs at the baccalaureate, master's, and doctoral levels, and offer programs leading to professional degrees at the baccalaureate and post-baccalaureate levels. The university cluster, which is the comprehensive institutions, states, offer associate and baccalaureate degree level and selected graduate programs within the context of its approved mission statement. So it seems to me that, that the mission that we have from starting back all the way back at merger is one that, that is not totally clear on this point. It has been our practice to limit the offering of doctoral programs to the doctoral cluster, but the, the mission statement for the university cluster, the comprehensives, would not necessarily require that we go back and change it or go make any statutory changes if we wanted to do this. But it would require that we shift the way we think about what this means. And so I think that that's one of the things that we're looking to you for some sense of whether or not this is something we should continue, we should explore further at this point. So then that leads to the question, should the UW comprehensives be authorized to offer professional doctorates either individually or in collaboration with another comprehensive institution. Because our, our preference in the last, and I guess that would be the right word to use, what, what we at System Administration Academic Affairs 
have been counseling our comprehensive campus colleagues as they come forward with these these concepts is the first choice would be to partner with Madison or Milwaukee. We have in the case of the doctor of nursing practice, the education committee heard a presentation a year ago from the nursing deans that were recommending the, the development of a <coughs> joint program between Oshkosh and Eau Claire, two comprehensive institutions for the doctor of nursing practice. At this point, we have not entertained any proposals for standalone professional degrees at the comprehensives. So some important questions to consider if we were to think about how far down this path we would like to go are how would the offering of professional doctorates impact the role of master's degrees and other forms of graduate education in our institutions? Um, will the addition of professional doctorates change the focus on undergraduate in education and institutional culture at the comprehensives? And to what extent is mission congruence an issue at individual comprehensive institutions? Clearly, we wouldn't be putting, entertaining the idea of a doctor of nursing practice at a degree, at a program that didn't have a nursing program. So, you know, I think that's that piece of the mission question. And then if we, as we do consider these, there are a number of implications. Resource implications, I think, are, are clearly there. And like any new degree program, they would have to be seriously considered. Moving up to another level of graduate education may, in some cases, require a different kind of resource base. And that's something we would need to pay attention to. Access in terms of, of looking at, do we have the right set of degrees to meet the needs of our state? Do we have? Do we have them in the right places? Brian mentioned, you know, nothing west of Milwaukee. There's also nothing north of Milwaukee, and we, we know a lot about, you know, what the needs are up in, in that part of the state. Pricing and revenue opportunities, in some ways, some institutions have looked at these degrees as revenue producers. We clearly are, um, you know, have competitors in this state in the for-profit education sector that are making money offering these degrees? Is this a market we can afford to stay out of? Might be a way to think about that question. The quality issue in terms of programs, curricula, faculty, facilities, you know, at, at the doctoral level, does, do we need to ratchet that up in, in any of those areas? We would need to be looking at that. Overall institutional capacity. And then finally, alignment with the growth agenda goals. I think that there's, I can argue both sides of this question. I can argue that if we're really serious about more baccalaureate degree holders in this state, we need to focus our issues of institutional capacity and resources on that. On this, at the same time, if we're serious about stronger communities, more better jobs, meeting the, the workforce demands to move the economy of this state forward, we may need more people with these professional doctorates and we may need to, to focus our resources in those directions. So those are the questions. And, and again, you know, I just emphasize what Kevin said at the beginning. We're not looking for any decisions today. We do not have any freestanding professional degree, doctoral degree programs in the pipeline that, that you'll have to be asked to consider um, in the near future. Um, what we're looking for is a sense of the board on professional doctorates and whether this is an area for future exploration or not. Is this something that we might want to say maybe someday, but not now? So I'm going to come and sit down. You may still want to ask your questions, even though you're sitting down. So that's <laughs> not a way to avoid getting these questions. Just one, one add-on to what Rebecca said. We, although we don't have any proposals for doctorates, from comprehensive institutions singly in the pipeline. We do have the one that Eau Claire and Oshkosh are working on together for a doctorate in nursing practice. And, and should that come through and be approved, that would be the first time in the UW system history, right, that a, that a doctoral correct. program was offered separate from either Madison or Milwaukee. Right. And that is a, that the work that's going on um, on that degree is is was um, kind of we were given a, a yellow light I'll say um, a year ago by the education committee to pursue that Rebecca when, um, can you just orient our thinking a little bit when when these proposals have come forward to 
your office. Mm -hmm. can, can you just sort of walk us through the analysis that that uh, academic affairs goes through, which so far has led to no, you may not. <laughs> Well, I don't think that, I, I guess I would have to say um, there's not much analysis and it's not at the point of a full proposal. Usually that comes up in, in a conversation with a provost or a conversation with a chancellor. And the position that I inherited in academic affairs was one um, that pretty clearly delineated um, doctoral programs at the, in the doctoral cluster. Doctoral programs at the comprehensives were something that this system doesn't do. And it's really been just in the last, um, well, since 2000, or the early 2000s, that under the pressure of the, the increasing credential and accreditation issues that you all know about in the, in the allied health sciences, that we have begun to entertain professional doctorates in any form at the comprehensives. It started with, you know, the physical therapy and audiology, um, both where we had very strong master's level programs at the comprehensives. When the credentials in those two fields moved from the master's degree being the coin of the realm to a doctoral degree being the coin of the realm, those two of our institutions partnered with the doctoral institution to create the new doctorate, doc, practical doctor, doctoral degree in those two fields. Um, and nursing is, is the other that we have anticipated. But, um, well, Brian will tell you that, you know, when he's come and said, you know, I really want to talk about a, a, a professional doctorate at Eau Claire, you know, my answer has been, that's not within our policy. And it's, you know, when you look at the written policy, you can see there's a window there. We could drive our truck through, or that's not through a window, hopefully, but <laughs> if we want it, if we want to. But it really would be a change in the interpretation of the policy and the practice um, that's been in the system from, since merger. Okay, then, then let me ask you. Let's say that we said, uh, well, the policy's changed, and, and now these are in the, in the realm of possibility for comprehensives. Um, uh, Chancellor Santiago is not here, but uh, Rita, the provost, is here. So now give us, a, uh, if you can, a feeling of um, what's going to happen at the UW-Milwaukee and UW-Madison campuses. You know, how is the world going to fall apart if, if the policy changes from, from the doctoral campus perspective? Well, I think maybe I'll let them answer that. And many of those uh, changes don't come forward to you. So master's programs uh, have requirements that change, um, particularly the professional masters. New courses, uh, our accrediting agencies will ask for additional courses, track changes, concentrations, etc. even name changes that never come to you. Uh, the professional doctorate uh, uh, activity, changing the entry to the profession, um, is something that is um, quite different than uh, launching new degree programs. We have expertise on uh, the comprehensive <coughs> campuses that have been um, historically um, very, very recognized for uh, quality programming at the master's level, providing entry to the profession. Uh, if we don't allow uh, doctoral programs uh, and the name change, the credit change and the emphasis change, uh, we will no longer be relevant for uh, entry into um, the uh, profession. I think that's very different than launching new programs in new areas that perhaps might provide uh, some uh, competitive uh, um, factors or even um, resource issues. So I think you really need to think uh, uh, through um, the differences here. Uh, one is really uh, about uh, uh, continuing to stay relevant in uh, programs that we're already engaged in, and the other is uh, looking uh, down the future, uh, that window, the truck through the window, 
uh, into uh, new areas that might uh, create competitiveness where we really don't want that to be. I think, let me... Um, well, actually, I thought Rita put it pretty well. Is I think from a practical perspective, I don't have a huge concern about uh, particularly programs, and DMP is a good example, where the expertise already exists on some of our comprehensive campuses. This is probably a bit of a, a extended expertise, but I think we have confidence that they have and can extend their, their internal expertise to teach at the DMP level. We can't it, hear you, Pat. Speak louder. <laughs> Does this thing actually work? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it's there's a whole world of fans out there. Why do I not believe that? Why do I not believe that? Did you hear Rita? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. good. Yes. Whatever she said. <laughs> um, no, I, I thought that uh, she expressed it well. Is I think my view from uh, our perspective is that I don't have any great heartburn about uh, particularly programs for which comprehensive have been active, have the expertise to deliver programs. DNP is a good example where those have been in the uh, have been teaching nursing for a while, even at the master's level. This is a, an extended level of expertise that's been that would be called for. I have confidence that they would be sure their faculty have the expertise to teach these courses. It's, I mean, in this, in the case of DNP, it's a very practical thing. They're sort of out of the business if they're not allowed to extend their programs to this level. So to me, that makes great sense. Uh, I don't foresee that there's any particular competitive problem, for example, with our own DNP program. We anticipate, again, to pick on DNP for a minute, we anticipate there'll be a lot of collaboration amongst the DNP programs. That is, we'll look for some course sharing opportunities, some expertise that lies on other campuses we can use, and vice versa. So, in my view, for those areas where there's expertise, there's reason, there's talent already available on the campuses, I don't, uh, from, I don't see any particular reason why we should handicap them from going there. Um, perhaps, I'm not sure this is exactly what Rita was getting at, I might have a little more concern if we're talking about completely new areas. And not to the level of saying, gee, I would be unalterably opposed, but more concerned. These could involve extended areas of expertise that perhaps aren't already present. They might be, but aren't already present, which then adds to the burden of uh, additional cost. That is, you have to bring talent to the campus to make these happen. So that, to me, is kind of a different class of, of degrees. Um, but for the ones where expertise is there, and particularly has been uh, delivered on campus to students for a long period of time, I don't really see any, any particular uh, challenge for us. Uh, I expect that quality programs will exist all over. There's demand, particularly in these medical, medical areas, for more than, much more than one program. Um, so I, I guess with regard to kind of what's on the table, I don't have a particular concern about those. I'm Regent Davis and Ambassador Glenn Smith. I think the timing of this question and hopefully a rich invigorating conversation on the part of Regents is perfect. Um, I think that it's awkward when you um, you get a one by one, you know, either a request or official request or a hint or whatever, and you're not able to put it in the context. And so as chair of the Education Committee, I welcome the conversation that we're having. And I think that it has been well presented to us, both in the original materials, uh, Rebecca's remarks, as well as the chancellors and the provost. And I just would encourage our colleagues to weigh in on this. And I, I think we should um, um, express what are some of the I don't know what you want to call them, guide, guideposts, guidelines, whatever, that we would be interested in making sure are present. For example, one for me is collaboration, collaboration and more collaboration. Um, but, but to give some sense of, um, from a public policy standpoint, which is our, our um, role, what, under what circumstances would we be supportive, of, if at all, of professional, 
doctoral degrees at the comprehensive. And so I guess I'm wanting to make sure that everybody um, takes this particular discussion really seriously because we really do need to figure out where we are as anything is developed um, further. Regent Vasquez. Mm -hmm. As I was reading the materials and, and thinking about all of this, uh, in my mind, the, the questions really centered on, on two things. One are the discussions and issues centered on two things. One was, um, to what extent do we want to ensure that the comprehensives uh, remain competitive and really um, are able to continue to draw uh, a broad range of, of students and uh, recognize that the world is changing and that we need to make sure that they are given the necessary tools to be competitive, to be able to draw and to in, uh, ensure that their uh, presence is, is very relevant. And then the second, so for me, the policy as it exists allows them to to have it. The bigger question to me was how do we make sure those and those questions are answered so that we don't have a proliferation of uh, professional doctorate degree programs that we become we have an access and that uh, we then start to either unintentionally or intentionally not using limited resources um, well. Um, how do we make sure that uh, we don't have our comprehensives even more aggressively competing with each other? Because there is some competition there, but that it, they don't start to, uh, we don't start eating ourselves up by competing, un, you know, in necessarily. Uh, that, and then how do we make sure that, uh, again, those uh, resources that we have are used correctly? So to me, the greater challenge of all of this has to do more with, uh, Kevin, your office in being able to really monitor and ensure that the system doesn't start to cannibalize itself, doesn't start to um, uh, unnecessarily be uh, thinning out even already uh, precious resources, but that we do continue to have a rather vigorous and uh, vibrant uh, system that allows the comprehensive to, comprehensives to continue to be uh, competitive. Regent Smith, and then we'll get everybody else to following up. I think on what you were saying, my concern was, or one of my concerns, is the effect on the <coughs> under, undergraduate education, and certainly on issues such as quality, access, affordability, and uh, that would be one of the going to your today would be one of the standards that I'd want to have somebody take a look at and when evaluating any proposals that came forth. But maybe Rick or Brian, it, 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 or anybody else over there. It, those issues of how this would affect the undergraduate education at your institution's affordability, accessibility, quality. What have you thought about that? Well, I mean, I think it goes back to what we wouldn't be pushing this forward if we didn't think there was huge need for us right. to have this program. I mean, I, sometimes you get into this, comprehensives want to do this because somehow it's going to elevate their status. Uh, elevate their status as like research. That's a wrong, you know, as a research like institution, that's a wrong reason to do it. Um, in, in, in the nurse practitioner area in, in particular, uh, this is important for the baccalaureate degree, even though the thing, the, 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 you know, because we will pick up some of the people that get this degree will be teaching for us as well. And I, I think our biggest challenge, and you know, Brian and I are most worried about getting the nursing positions filled to be able to continue to. Uh, you know, deliver the demand for the baccalaureate degrees and the master's degrees in, uh, in our nursing programs. And this should help that, uh, uh, I think, as well. Um, and then, you know, as, as said before, we're out of the business if we don't do this. So then we just would let, I guess, uh, Madison and Milwaukee do it all. Um, but uh, but as, I, as we said before, this is our strength. These are our roots. This is what we come of, education and nursing. And um, it's our obligation to keep providing, you know, that kind of level of education is necessary as the licensure requirements and, and others go up. Um, and I, and, you know, and I, I agree with Brian too that I, I think there's some possibilities of keeping this uh, 
uh, uh, you know, as, a, as close to revenue neutral as possible, because you're not, you're not talking about a lot of additional facilities or expensive scientific equipment. I mean, you've got equipment needs, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's not the same thing as some of the fields that you would go in to be competitive at PhD level, uh, you know, kind of a basic research programs can be very, very expensive. Um, uh, so I guess that in summary, I think it actually enhances the, the quality experience. The, the other thing is we're going to have to do something about the competitiveness of the nursing faculty salaries anyway, and I'm just going to be flat out honest. This makes it easier in our campus to accept the fact that we've got to get those nursing faculty salaries up um, uh, you know, if we're going to fill those nursing positions. So that's another way of answering your question about how that helps the baccalaureate program. We, we've got nine positions we're looking for. He's looking for seven. Uh, and we both know we've got to significantly increase the compensation for nursing faculty on a campus where a lot of faculty, most faculty, can make the argument their compensation needs to go up too. So in a certain sense, I think it helps us make that case in an understandable way in our campus when you have a doctoral program and a faculty that has to maintain that does need to be given some priority, in particular since there's huge need out there. One other, one other aspect of that, um, uh, Regent Smith said, re you know, uh, revenue implications. Uh, revenue neutral, I might e entertain a proposal from a program for a revenue neutral program if it had other benefits for the community, uh, meet community demand, economic development, um, or be a track to provide a more, more continuous stream of good quality undergraduates to the university and, and some other, through some other influencers. I'd want to see some revenue positive proposals. Um, and we're facing, you know, I'm sitting here, I have a draft of, of the, 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 the initial reduction that the system's been asked to go through by DOA. Uh, who knows what the next one's going to look like. Uh, we need every opportunity we can get and every flexibility we can get to go out and generate additional revenue on our own. And these kinds of programs, whether they be some are at the master's level, some might be at the doctoral level, are a potential way to do it. It's not a silver bullet. It's one other tool that we can use to go out and, 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 and another thing to keep faculty, to develop our own faculty. I mean, there are a number of benefits from this. So. I wouldn't be looking at a revenue negative proposal very positively within my own campus. That wouldn't even get to system. And I think I'd, I'd also want to uh, perhaps uh, ease uh, Regent Vasco's concern about, you know, we, I think we have a, even, even with the improvements that Rebecca has made in the degree vetting process and the streamlining of that, we still have a process whereby each of the campuses comments on proposals by the other campuses. And so that if there is serious uh, duplication, competitive issues, uh, <coughs> any sort of cross-jurisdictional issues, those are going to come up, and, and that won't even get to the regions until those are resolved. And, mm -hmm. and system uh, staff already do that. Um, and the same thing with, with the demand. We, we go through uh, considerable effort to demonstrate, and you all question then, whether there's adequate demand for a program. Many of these, by the way, are offered on a cohort model, so that you don't continuously offer the program. Uh, you offer it when the demand is there and when it's financially feasible to do so. Um, and I, my argument is that that gives us another potential revenue stream to offset the costs of continuing to maintain quality undergraduate education and continuing to maintain spaces without, without drastic tuition increases. Pigeon Crane. Uh, I, wa I was one of the people who uh, really wanted this discussion, uh, partly because I knew I didn't understand uh, the issues. And this has been helpful. Um, I especially appreciate some of what you said, Rick, about um, the importance of uh, the strength of programs, uh, of sister programs, I think you call them, within an institution. So that's been helpful. But I'm still not clear um, whether there are when I see one of the considerations that's called for is quality, I'm not, sh I'm not sure what that question is, whether the, that's an issue of um, whether or not the, the resources are there to provide the, a, a quality program or whether there's some other uh, factor, in, including, and I'm not sure I've, 
some suspicion that I've heard from some voices that there's somehow a diminishing of the quality of a doctor's degree by the proliferation of the programs, if, if, if you understand that, that question. I, I, it, it's not that I suspect that myself, but, what, but I'm not sure I've understood what the <coughs> philosophical issues might be around that. I, the competitive ones are pretty clear to me, but... Um, Or is my, is my question unintelligible? Well, I, I think, I think the, the quality issue, is, as I posted up here, really has to do, you know, partly with resources, partly with the depth of, of, the, of the, um, the faculty expertise on a campus, the, the quality of the curriculum, all the kinds of ways that we would think about quality in a master's program or in a baccalaureate program. Whether you could deliver. Whether you could deliver a degree that would be worthy of the UW name. The other part of your comment, though, is one that I think that we've all wrestled with as we've watched the, the increasing number of degrees that start with the word doctor. Yeah. And they're just, as there are more of them, you know, it challenges the, 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 the aura. <laughs> the, the aura or the view that we've had held mm -hmm. around the PhD mm -hmm. for many, many years. And, and so I, I did not mean to, to go down that path in posing quality as one of the issues to be considered. I wasn't suspecting no. that you, you were, but I wanted to get it on the table. Sure. And I, I think you can make an argument that uh, quality in a, in a research-intensive PhD <laughs> program is different from quality in an EDD program, or certainly some of the ones that are clearly professional practice programs. I, but I don't know that, that we as a profession have adequately defined quality in some of these other areas. I think it's more defined in PhD level, not that it's perfectly defined there either. Uh, Regent Falbo. I'm going to make some assumptions and then have a question. It, it, it appears that there's certainly support for this at the levels and then you support it. Um, I don't have a problem with, with, with Judy's question as long as you guys don't have a problem with it. Uh, and assume that if you do it, you'll do it correctly for all the right reasons. <coughs> Uh, that would be economically feasible. Is there any other concerns we should have? Is there any negatives that we should know about in going this route? Well, let me put one on the table, and this is a little bit of the elf in the room, and I'd ask some of our colleagues to respond to this. Um, Rick kind of touched on this a bit, but, you know, there's a natural tendency in all healthy, successful organizations to want to acquire and maintain higher levels of prestige. And in our business, having doctoral degrees is probably still generally thought to be one uh, kind of prestige that one can acquire and maintain. Um, one of the, the, the things I think we ought to talk through is whether or not, and, and that the desire for prestige is a good thing, and, and it applies not only to institutions but to individuals. And uh, faculty who teach in doctoral programs among faculty tend to have more prestige perhaps than those who don't, or at least that's the standard way of thinking about it. Now, people say that's bad, and it may well be. They may be right when they say that's bad, but it's also, I think, still pretty much the culture. Uh, so one of the questions here, I think, that, that we ought to put on the table and, and kick around is whether or not one of the negative results of this could be that you have faculty who want to teach smaller and smaller courses in narrower and narrower areas of their expertise. And the desire and the ability to do that in some doctoral programs pulls them away from devotion of, of time and energy to more students at the master's and undergraduate level. And if that's not going to happen, does that mean we need to hire considerably high numbers of additional new faculty? Uh, what about that? No. No, I, well, I, 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 jump. I think um, that's why making sure we have good guidance and policy about on what conditions you're going to expand a professional doctoral mission at a comprehensive if it goes is important mm -hmm. because you, you could have pressure to add things more and more and more when you really shouldn't do that because people are trying to make the prestige argument as you're saying. 
in this case, at least the one, I mean, now we're not supposed to just talk about the one that we're hoping to get <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, you know, it, I think it's reasonable to expect that we'll have to give some careful thought and consideration to some others. Mm -hmm. Hopefully well argued and within the policy guidelines like the, the EDD or PhD in education. Um, that might be a little, that, that will, you know, uh, lead to some different kinds of questions than this one because we're, we're kind of stuck here at a certain level, you know. Uh, this is a licensure thing. Um, you, you know, the actually the the um, the healthcare community isn't always crazy about uh, having their credentials go up because their cost of their labor force goes up and, and things of that sort. But the issue is, is the practice of nursing, and we deeply believe this is such now that it does require uh, this increased level of, of quote credential. Mm -hmm. it, it just absolutely does. So I don't, I can't see that. I could, mm -hmm. I, I got to be honest. My former institution, I think our problem was more that we had these other types. That, that was an institution that thought it was going to be research university in a thicker way, and it started these programs, um, and then and and it got kind of left with just four research doctorates. And I worried more about the quality of those and how to enhance those and how to hook up with IU and Purdue faculty and things of that sort, and we did some of that to strengthen those programs. Mm -hmm. That's where you get in trouble because then people start thinking, well, we're becoming a research university, so we're going to compare our salaries to research universities, and Indiana State was much more a comprehensive university, you know, in the positive sense of that than a research university. So that's when you get in trouble, yeah. is when you get in an, Indi an Indiana State-like situation. I apologize, my God, it's a great institution, but that, that was a problem. We had the associate to the doctorate. We had stretched it, and, and it really questioned whether we, you know, we confused our campus as to what kind of institution we were and that we need to transform the niche we're in and not try to jump into the IU or the Purdue niche. That was a constant conflict on that campus uh, because of this, this issue. So as long as we are cognizant of not going there with our comprehensives, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And let me say that. Um, I don't want anybody to read my putting the um, issue on the table to say I'm against the idea. I, I just think in response to the kind of questions we're getting, we need to talk through what the possible downsides are. And if we're going to go forward, find ways to put in policies and procedures that, that guard against going where we don't want to go, if, if we don't want to go there. Chancellor Gow. So this is going out on, on the web, right? I feel compelled to say hello to everybody at Indiana. <laughs> Um, we have a doctorate of physical therapy at La Crosse, and I think we do it well, and, and our accreditors have told us that, and the students have, and, and it's a great program for us. I wasn't there. And it's in it's collaboration with UW-Milwaukee. With Milwaukee. That's correct, yes. Um, <laughs> I wasn't there when it was launched, but I don't think prestige was the motivation. I, I think it would be more appropriate to say visibility. And I think on this question of what do these programs do for the undergraduate experience, I think if they're done well, as any program, it enhances the visibility of the institution and everybody wins. And I think that's been the case um, with us. On the, um, we need to remember these are allied health fields and they are a little bit different I was thinking, you know, when we were talking about the doctorate and how hard it is to get, and I thought of my own speech communication doctorate. And I don't think the world was really cared one way or the other whether there's another PhD in speech communication, frankly, to be honest. I mean, but physical therapy or nursing, they do. And, and there are very strong demands for these things. And so if we can meet those demands and do it in a way that balances uh, the program with the other ones, and, and, and I'm fascinated by what you said because I can tell you at UWL we have absolutely no desire to be a research university. We have people doing great research and it's important, but our niche is being a great comprehensive where teaching is first and we would never stray from that and, and, and that, that would be foolish. So. Yeah, I, I think there is some of this that goes on nationally, but I think in our system, we do that quite well in terms of who we are and, and, and what we're trying to do. Provost Nook, and then we'll come back to some regions who have questions. Mark. 
I want to speak from a couple perspectives. One is as the provost of UW Stevens Point, which has the Odd D program in conjunction with UW Madison, and the other is uh, a person who just left St. Cloud State in the Minnesota system, and, and they have an EDD program now. And I was there in that system as it was working through, and these discussions were going on. We're crazy not to do this, is what it comes down to. Um, let me talk first about the the Odd D program. It, it really is a, a collaborative effort, as Danae pointed out. It really is important. It's working well with our, our partners in Madison. Uh, it's working great for these students. And more importantly, these programs provide a level of access that we just can't offer if all of our PhD programs, EDD, especially these, these professional practice programs, are in Madison and Milwaukee. We've got people that want to be superintendents of schools, that want to be in ed leadership. We need nurses out there that have professional doctorate degrees in nursing and they can't take times off their job and get into the programs here at Madison and Milwaukee to do that. The comprehensives are pretty good at offering cohort programs. Our ed programs in particular know how to do this and have been doing it for years. And so we have the expertise in the comprehensives to step out and do that sort of thing. I think the EDD and the nursing practitioner degrees are excellent places to start because the need is so high and because the comprehensives really do have the expertise already, the facilities already, the faculty to pull this off. Um, and so it, it really is something that, that we need to step up and do for the system, for the people of Wisconsin. I think as we do this, we really do need to look at the impact and, and, and have a plan for how we do it. We can't let this just grow. We can't have PhD programs popping up at, at all of these comprehensive institutions. Quite frankly, none of us want to do that. Um, but very targeted uh, professional doctorate programs, very hands-on programs that serve our areas, that serve our region, serve the entire state extremely well, add institutions who already have the expertise and the facilities to do that, uh, which is the case at, at Oshkosh and uh, at Eau Claire with the professional uh, nursing degree. It was what attracted Madison and the system to Stevens Point with Odd D. We had a strong communication uh, disorders program. It was a natural fit. And quite frankly, several of those graduates that we have coming through that program would never be able to come to Madison with this degree. So it's just really a no-brainer to go ahead and do this. It's something the system needs. It's something the people of Wisconsin needs. And we've got the expertise setting at, at several of our comprehensive universities to do it. Um, additionally, one of the questions was asked about what's this impact on your graduates. From our Odd D program, it just raises the level of that program. You've got graduate students around who are working on professional certification. Those undergraduates interact with those students. They know those students. They see what they're doing. They understand what the next level is. Without that PhD program, Odd D program, that doesn't exist. So I really do, you know, not to be crass or pushy, I really do believe this is something we've got to do for our, not only for the system, but for the people of Wisconsin. Let's start at Eileen Zen and then we'll just come around. Regent right. Conley Kiesler. I'm glad we're having this discussion. I've been kind of pushing it <laughs> since Oshkosh brought it to my attention probably 18 months ago. But, I, you know, I'm 100% behind this, whether they're standalones or they're collaborative. I think we have to do it. We have to move forward. I would love system to bring forward all the answers to all the questions that we have to, to start making some proposals, get it on the table, and move this forward. Um, and I think the board always, you know, the buck stops here. You can say no. If, if, if some institution wants something that we really do not believe um, is at the best interest of any one of these campuses and that it's about prestige, you have, we can say no. It, why don't you get past the May's committee? I guarantee you. Bringing back all the answers and uh, be able to get this in place. All right. Uh, thank you. Regent Vasquez, did you have another comment? Yeah, my, just two quick points. One is that um, clearly this seems to be um, an area that is market driven. And maybe naively, I'm thinking that. Uh, I don't think we're going to have uh, all the comprehensive stepping forward and having multiple and multiple number of uh, PhD programs because I think it's it's really market driven as to whether there's a, a real demand and whether um, there are, our graduates are going to be employed and so on and so forth. So 
maybe I'm very naive, but I, I just don't think that we're opening a floodgate that is going to be difficult to uh, close because everybody's going to want you know whatever number of PhDs on on their respective campus. I, I just don't think that's going to happen. Uh, the other thing also is for me one of the things that we keep using the word collaboration and even referencing to the two um, examples. I would hope that this leads to creating collaborations only when they are absolutely positively needed mm -hmm. for the absolute benefit of the students and it's not creating a, co a collaboration simply because of artificial reasons. Artificial reason, no, we can't let you have your own PhD, therefore you've got to co collaborate even though in your own campus you could have the whole program yourself. Um, to me, collaborations where they're for artificial reasons are not necessarily uh, the most effective uh, collaborations. But um, that hopefully this will still encourage that there be collaborations, but that they be done for a very different set of reasons as to why they, they need to be, uh, we need to have those type of collaborations. Thank you. Regent Davis. And Kevin, I really appreciate the fact that you invited um, discussion around the elephants in the room. Mm -hmm. So I would like to raise one. Um, and, and it's a question. I don't have a clue whether this is an issue or not. But I'm, I'm thinking hopefully it wouldn't be 36 years later before we revisit whether this was a good <laughs> idea or not if we decided to do this. But in the off chance that, um, you know, 10, 20 years later, things look differently than what was originally thought. Would, would there be a possibility that some campuses who don't have, you know, the demand, the expertise, da 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 da, da whatever may be those kind of guideposts that we would want to put in place, that there would be a feeling of them being left behind or viewed as less than, you know, um, because they didn't have a PhD in XYZ professional doctoral degree? And is that, a, is that a possible issue? Is that a real issue? And if so, is there anything we should do about that? And what are your thoughts and whoever wants to talk about it? And then the second thing I wanted to say is that let's be mindful of um, the fact that we were, as painful as it may have felt for some of us, um, the liberal arts degree guidelines that we put in place are a good model of how you can, you know, put what you want, um, to, how you ensure that what we want to have happen happens without being, in my view anyway, without being overly restrictive and certainly not arbitrary and all of that kind of stuff. And I would assume that whatever we ended up doing would take that model and, and fast adapt in terms of coming up with, with the guidelines. But mm -hmm. on the issue of the little bitty elephant, do you have any comments? Well, I'll give you my reaction. And then again, others I think will probably have theirs. Uh, you know, I, is there some risk there? I suppose uh, I, I'm kind of more convinced there's more risk if we don't do mm -hmm. some of this mm -hmm. for a lot of the reasons you've already heard, I guess. Um, but I think one of the things we've tried to do in recent years, Danae, is to say to the comprehensives, you, we don't, it's speaking for system, speaking for the board, we don't want you to be all vanilla. Right. We want you to be able to define your niche, and we want you to be able to, def to define excellence within the kind of niche that you set for yourself. So. Uh, and I, th I hope, I think our colleagues at uh, the institutions believe that that's our attitude and that we have encouraged that. And I think there's evidence that we have, and I think we will continue to. And if that's the atmosphere everybody feels they're working in, then there are lots of different ways to define excellence and quality and prestige given what your agreed upon goals are. And that one of them doesn't have to be that you have an EDD or some other kind of uh, doctorate in, of, uh, in the clinical area, but I, I'd be happy to hear other people's reactions. Mark again. I guess two of us already have these degrees, and I don't think the other campuses feel like we're better than they do. Um, so I don't really see that <laughs> being a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank you for going that up. Uh, uh, and I think this goes back. So one of the points that's been made, it, it's really important that the, this focus on a handful of very applied doctorate programs and, and that, you know, it is something that we need in the state. It does mean that institution offers an EDD, but prestige doesn't necessarily go with that for the entire university campus. We see it in COMD. It's really elevated our COMD program to have the ODD program but it really hasn't necessarily meant anything for our liberal arts degrees or 
conservation and natural resources <coughs> degrees, and I don't think it certainly hasn't made any difference to my standing with provosts or the chancellor's standings as well. You know, it, we have a degree. We've got the <coughs> facilities to do that, so we offer it. Um, I don't really see a, a problem with that. I didn't see it happening in, in Minnesota system as we developed the EDD program at Mankato and at St. Cloud. The other schools had some things they wanted to look at, um, but they knew they weren't ready to offer some of these other degrees, and so they came along as, as sort of natural outgrowths. This system does have some really good strengths in each of its comprehensives, and we're all building on those, and it what's makes this system unique as opposed to the Minnesota system where the comprehensives really are comprehensive as opposed to having a focus in something that they're known for. So I see it as, as less of a, an issue in this system than I would in, in the Minnesota system. Well said. Thank you. Yeah. Others, uh, Chancellor Ward. Well, we, we don't really have a dog in this hunt. At UWGB. Um, but we do in a way because we are increasingly taking a regional approach to higher education in the whole new north region. And I, I'm sure this wouldn't have been said 20 years ago, but Oshkosh is really a partner of ours. And so if Oshkosh can't go forward on a professional doctorate, that hurts our region. Um, and therefore, uh, I think it's extremely important that they can go forward on it, and uh, we'll work with them and support them as best we can. So it's it's really a regional issue, I think, and um, maybe someday we'll have a professional doctorate in environmental management come back to you and say <laughs> we want that, uh, but it's not there now. I don't think it diminishes us. We feel the same way about Stevens Point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, um, Regent Keene. Oh, yeah. okay. I Thank you. Um, so many good points made by so many people, chancellors, provosts, regents. Um, for me, one of the pros of going ahead with this is number two on the list up here. I think it would be number one on my list is accessibility to people around the state to be able to get professional doctorates without having to go to Milwaukee or Madison. Um, it just... And I know, like even in my own life and in a lot of my friends' lives, it would have made a difference to have something more convenient. And, I mean, there are for-profits out there right now online offering uh, PhDs. Um, like Eileen said, we should go for it now because somebody else will. Uh, it, it Maybe it will be, you know. Um, well, it's going to take us a little bit, but I don't think it will be a rev – I think it will be a revenue producing for our state um, besides – for the campuses, but for the state as a whole and our economy, to see people to be able to go forward in their professional lives with these degrees. Um, a richer academic environment for all students on the campuses that offer the professional doctorates. And I think, Kevin, you mentioned by having that those advanced degrees on campuses, it draws people to those campuses. And we just got done talking about what we could do to enrich our faculty um, that faculty's lives maybe by offering them the opportunity to offer PhD degrees on their local campus would be another drawing point for retaining our faculty um, throughout the state. So I don't really see it as um, an either or as far as promoting the growth agenda through more baccalaureate degrees because it goes hand in hand. It's all part of our, our education um, promotion statewide and that in my opinion the time to move forward would be now. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Falbo and then back to Regent Appenworth. I just wanted to say I'm looking so forward, Brian, to the opportunity to see the revenues this is going to generate. <laughs> 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 I may be a little pessimistic about that, but it sure will be fun. All right. Regent Appenworth. Uh, well, I was along the same lines, I guess. I don't know if this is a, a great comparison, but what uh, are the other programs currently running? Are they revenue neutral? Are uh, the other the clinical doctorates or professional? Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Let's hear from the campuses that have them. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, we don't. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, 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 I'm fairly confident it is not uh, negative. <laughs> 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 I don't know what you're 
in the case of nursing, but I, I can tell you it's not at the doctoral level, but it, it reinforces Brian's point, and I think a number of you know this. You know this uh, online uh, nursing degree, accelerated nursing degree that our provost and our college of nursing dean and, uh, and Tom Sartland, our vice chancellor, put together generated 200 additional BSN degrees and actually made money that got put into the the traditional baccalaureate degree program delivery system on campus. So there is demand, where there is demand in the industry, I think that's Brian's point, they, they will pay. I mean, you'd say, well, how can a student afford to pay, I think on that program was $28,000 or $29,000? Well, the student wasn't paying it. The healthcare industry was paying it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so there is some possibility, but I, I wanted to be a little less <laughs> aggressive on, uh, on the revenue side of it. Uh, I, I think, though, the, the question about the, re, the the professional doctor one isn't as big of an issue, but I think at some point what we all need to struggle with a much more complex and very important thing is the research mission in the UW system and the different ways it's delivered. Now, Oshkosh is not a research university, but we do research. We need to leverage better and support better the research expertise of the faculty to meet other kinds of needs for research uh, in our region and in our state. Uh, that's, a that's a different discussion but because we get a lot of pressure, uh, and I thought that's where David Ward was going to go, and I know David Wilson's made this point a number of times. We, we, we aren't doing a good enough job leveraging our research capacity of our faculty, working with our students, undergraduate students, on a lot of the challenges that we're facing. And when people say, have said to me, Oshkosh needs to become another, re the third research university, so that, that, that may be, but it has to be a special kind. Uh, but until we properly support Milwaukee, UW-Milwaukee, and then leverage it, it's, it's premature to talk about one or more campuses. And we're struggling in the new north with how to do that together as a region. And so that's a much stickier, difficult thing to do. If we figure out how to do that in the state, it's going to help the state a lot. And what I mean by that is get all these great faculty in the comprehensive institutions better supported to do, to do research uh, of the type that the state needs. Others on the revenue issue, and, and then we'll come back to Regent Bartell. Mark? Our, our RD program, I don't know whether tuition wise it's, it's revenue neutral or not, but one of the advantages it has is because it's an audiology program, we've got a clinic that we run. And so there's some revenue generation through the clinic. Um, so other than just tuition, there's another revenue source. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not big, um, uh, but. Uh, it, it does exist, and some of these other applied programs can go that way as well. Uh, Regent Bartel. Uh, this has been an excellent discussion, I think, and uh, I think that uh, system administration uh, now has a better sense as to what, what to do. And I, I suspect that Rebecca has been making notes, just as I have, it, uh, of the elements that we're, we're trying to pick out of this discussion as to how to evaluate uh, applications for uh, expansion of uh, doctorate programs with comprehensive. The um, and I've been writing notes here, uh, and I and I it's clear that expertise on campus is one of the elements. Um, this matter of revenue neutrality or whether what the financial effect of it is is another. The uh, demand for the degree is certainly one. The, the one element that I'm not clear on is this idea of collaboration. What are, what are the components of collaboration that we should be looking for as these programs come forward? And, and I, I, I don't know who should answer that, but that, that I understand what generally what collaboration is, but what are the elements of that in this context? And I bombed. And, and, and I, well, I asked Janae, but I, 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 <laughs> well, I think I think at this stage of the game, they they are drawing upon expertise of faculty and other campuses to you know perhaps even as far as sharing courses, expertise in developing the developing the programs together. I think the Doctor of Nursing Practice is a good example of of um, a set of pr program proposals that are coming forward that began as a conversation among all of the nursing deans about, you know, what should these look like? How should we be developing them? Should we do it together? Should we do it independent of each other? Where does, it, where does collaboration make the most sense? You know, and where would it be better to, to have a standalone program but still draw upon the expertise in different areas? And so I really think that it, 
I, I have, sorry to say it depends, but I think that, yeah. that it, like all of our programs, we want to, as um, Regent Vasquez said, make sure that we're not just putting up an artificial barrier and saying you have to have collaboration so that you have the right set of institutions involved. We want to have collaboration that's meaningful, that really makes a difference in the, in the quality of the program. So, so the collaboration that was involved here could simply be collaboration in the planning and, and development of the program, not necessarily offering courses in one place or in, in, in other courses in another. It, right? it could be a number of different things, yeah. I mean, one thing that occurs to me in response to your question, Jeff, is that the, um, one of the advantages that uh, a Madison or Milwaukee has when they have graduate programs is they tend to have larger departments and people who are therefore specialized in certain areas in discipline at a, at a depth. And, and some of the comprehensive departments aren't that large. You might not have then access to certain kinds of specialties within a discipline at that one campus, whereas if, if two campuses were offering the program together, graduate students, in this case indeed doctoral students, would have access to specialties that they are particularly interested in or they believe they needed for the kind of practice that they wanted to do at the other institution that they were collaborating with. One kind of collaboration. Yes, Brian. Uh, what, yeah, I think, I think there's um, considerable latitude for collaboration. There already is quite a bit of collaboration. Uh, we have a a consortium that offers an online MBA program. I think it's five institutions. Um, that is very revenue positive. Um, and, uh, and and the courses are offered where the expertise is. And so and it's online, so it's easy to do that. Uh, we do run into some technical issues here, though, in terms of degree granting. Right. And whether a degree is consortial and whether the Higher Learning Commission of the NCA will even allow that. And we have now run into that problem with our, or our MBA program. Uh, and it comes down to them asking simple questions like who admits the student, who advises the student, who transcripts the program. Um, and, and they want an institution to be responsible for that degree. Um, or each one will be separately accredited. So. So there are issues there, and those are some of the some of the discussions we've been having around the doctorate nursing practice. Uh, we need to work those out so that our individual institutions don't end up sort of getting on the block with the accreditation authorities and the De Department of Education, because then then that reflects badly on the institution. Um, so I think there's a you know a kind of a rationality we certainly want to create within the system and the use of resources, uh, but the market isn't always rational, as, as we certainly know now. Um, but even the market for higher education is not always rational and, and can't necessarily be categorized. But uh, I, I think we're always looking to find other places we can offer programs. I'd say the New North is doing that. Uh, Chuck at Stout and at River Falls and at Eau Claire, we're, we're having considerable discussions around how we can collaborate not only academically but in non-academic areas as well, and create some cost savings on a regional basis. So, uh, so these are, you know, we're, we're looking again in a, in, a, in a world of declining prospective revenues, even revenue neutral looks good. Provost <laughs> Chang, did you? Not only the initial design, but also the continuous review, uh, collaboration across uh, areas um, in, in the particular uh, field, uh, and also uh, discussions about how to stay uh, as current uh, in the profession. The um, health professions, uh, nursing, um, DNP, uh, occupational therapy, etc., uh, are all facing uh, shortages of faculty. So uh, designing these programs uh, 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 in a very efficient way is really important and continuing that collaboration uh, and conversation across the campuses I think will be important. Thanks, that's very helpful. Mark? I think the other, we've talked a lot about collaboration within the system, the other sort of collaboration we need to realize, especially with the supply program, 
is collaboration with clinical sites and with school districts and things of that sort. So collaboration outside of the UW system with our applied partners. That's really crucial when you're talking about the applied programs that we're meeting their needs. Any other uh, questions from regents, other colleagues? Reaction. Well, uh, we are getting ten minutes away from I think when we're supposed to end. Uh, you know, I, I no, no, no. You're at the no, end. Right. We're at the end. Yeah, two twenty. I thought it was two thirty. Two five. Yeah, um, uh, I'll do this quickly. Uh, uh, <laughs> I hope that, that, that the regents and, and all the colleagues who were involved in, in participating in this felt this has been a good day. I mean, I think very much so. very in my much. mind, this is the kind of thing we hope to do with these meetings when we decided we would go this, this route. So uh, if, uh, and I want to thank everybody who participated. And if you liked it, uh, tell President Bradley. If you didn't like something about it, tell me and we'll fix it. That's oh, a good idea. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah. you know, this is uh, um, primarily designed as this uh, detailed discussions for us because we ultimately have to make the decision. But I, I think that you, the, you know, the people who are going to recommend something, got as much or more. Uh, the questions that we ask, the responses, this kind of dialogue. And and I can, you know, everybody knows if we had a resolution on the table today, we never would have had those, these types of discussions. So very good. And, and I, I, it's it's interesting how um, the, these issues overlap and they just roll up to this great big enterprise that we have the, the challenge to administer on behalf of the public. Mm -hmm. Let's take a break until 2.30 and we will start right at 2.30 with uh, Brent Smith's report on the Business Finance and Audit Committee. Yes.
I would now call upon Regent Slot to present the report for the Business Finance and Audit Committee. All right. Wow, look at everything. I should just say hush. Our committee met at 8.18 a.m. this morning, and uh, we first looked at the UW Oshkosh Porn and Vending Rights contract with Tufts Cola. We, we approved the five-year contract with Tufts Cola, and that provide <coughs> porn and vending services to UW Oshkosh. It's got a two-year option on it. Um, this was, I think a lot of the inquiry this morning was the student involvement in the approval of the contract and what the money got used for. We used that criteria before, I think, in looking at some of these contracts. There was a committee of seven that approved the contract proposal uh, for student representatives. Of the revenue they have from the Pepsi contract, 75% are dedicated to student services and 25% supports academic initiatives that address student interests. Uh, there's a committee with student representation that approves funding requests for the money from the Pepsi-Cola Pepsi contract. We also held our annual public forum on UW System Trust Fund investments. I know President Bradley and Vice President Pruitt miss coming to that particular meeting as they have in the past. Did you want, did you want to see the scars? <laughs> Those are special moments. <laughs> um, for the second consecutive year, unfortunately, no individuals requested to speak at the forum. Our, <laughs> we did receive a question regarding the impact of the current economic downturn on UW trust funds. The trust fund balance is down 17% for the year, but there's no present risk to meeting current <coughs> funding uh, commitments. So, on behalf of the committee, move adoption of the resolution concerning UW Oshkosh pouring and vending rights contract with Pepsi Cola. Is there a second? Second. I move to second it. Any discussion? Any questions? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? That would motion carries. Time report, Mr. President. Thank you very much. So now we will turn to the presentation of our annual Teaching Excellence Awards, which. For all members who have had experience on the board, is truly one of our high points. It's just, just one of the most reaffirming things we do. So I'll call upon Regent Danae Davis. <coughs> Thank you, President Bradley. And I am so thrilled, as I always am, um, to be a part of today's presentation of the Regents Teaching Excellence Awards. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to our award recipients. Professor Heil from UW Oshkosh. Um, um, Professor Splett from UW, did I do that right? Yes. Okay, from UW River Falls. <laughs> and um, Professor Bindel, who is representing the UW Scouts Department of Math, Statistics, and Computer Science. I know that they are a um, wonderful uh, cast of loved ones, family members, friends, and colleagues who have supported the endeavors of our honorees today, and I want to say welcome to all of you as well. As we've done for 16 years now, the Regents today conferred three awards, two individual awards and one department program award. And as always, our challenge was a good problem to have, choosing recipients from among an excellent pool of candidates representing the true excellence on our campuses. This year's selection team included Regents Bartell, Drew, Vasquez, Thomas, and Womack. And though one half were new to the task, the uh, richness of the discussion made our process both fun and fulfilling. I'm also, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the other region committee members as well, that we love being a part of this process um, and celebration. Among the nominations of so many outstanding teachers, we looked for nominees who are deeply committed to understanding and learning in their students. We saw for evidence in the student support letters that these individuals had indeed changed lives. And while these dedicated professors developed different techniques to create effective teaching skills and to foster learning, they all demonstrated a remarkable sensitivity to needs of their students and a commitment to high standards. So we feel proud of our tradition of celebrating inclusive excellence. And in our efforts to foster intellectual and economic growth by preparing capable citizens in Wisconsin and in our public institutions of higher education in the state, we continually seek improvement. And these honored 
uh, professionals prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are worth every song. We deliver what we promise. We create an environment in which students from various backgrounds, levels of education, and various talents and passions for a specific discipline, whether it's in film studies, math, or agriculture, receive the education they need and want. As we grow the number of baccalaureate holders, uh, degree holders in our state, we want all citizens to proceed toward a better future and to share knowledge with their communities. Knowledge is power indeed, but knowledge is also compassion, sharing, and care for each other wherever we are in the state. That is truly the Wisconsin idea. Regents Bartell and Thomas will now introduce each of the individual winners and present to them their awards. And after each, pre uh, each regent presents the award and finishes um, his or her remarks, each of the awardees will take the podium to address the board and our guests with remarks of their very own. So you all see the profiles of our award winners. Um, and without further ado, I believe it's Regent Bartell. Thanks very much, Danae. Um, I want you folks over here to know that there are a number of pleasures that the regents get. One is that you get to wear this little pin right here. <laughs> Another is we get a wonderful box lunch once a, once a month. But uh, more seriously, uh, we, we as a group can uh, directly affect the lives of 170 plus thousand students uh, around the state. And uh, more significantly for today, we have an opportunity to observe on a regular basis the skill and creativity and passion and dedication of those who teach our University of Wisconsin students. There are many, many faculty and staff throughout the system for whom teaching is more than merely a job. It is a life-fulfilling mission uh, with many rewards that are often more psychic than monetary, as we know. While we see and appreciate the talents and devotion to education of teachers throughout the UW system on a regular basis, today is the day on which the Board of Regents of the University of Wisconsin system expresses its deeply felt appreciation and admiration of all of the great teachers of the UW system by honoring some of the very best. Now, uh, as Danae said, we first will recognize Professor Douglas Heil, Professor of Communication at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. And Doug, I'd ask you to stand while I say a few things about you so that uh, you can look embarrassed. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Douglas Heil is a professor in the Department of Communication at UW Oshkosh, where he has taught for the last 20 years. His emphasis is in the area of radio, television, and film. He has written extensively with numerous publications at the national level, including a much heralded uh, book called Primetime Authorship in the area of creative screenwriting. He has received uh, more than a dozen grants. Uh, he's written and produced uh, three award-winning short films and a theatrical musical uh, that includes a number of award-winning songs. Is Joe Gao still here? I, I, we would love to uh, perform those sometime if you give us an opportunity. Uh, over the years, he has served uh, as a member of various campus committees. He is a longtime faculty advisor for the Film uh, Society and International Film Series. And he has been a recipient of the UW Oshkosh Distinguished Teaching Award and a number of other uh, recognitions. The materials and testimonials that our committee reviewed as part of Professor Heil's nomination included a great many of his professional accomplishments and, tri and uh, tributes to his scholarship, all of which were very impressive. But I have to tell you that even more impressive to me and I think to the other members of the committee was his obvious commitment to his students. He received overwhelmingly rave reviews and evaluation scores from those he taught, those he mentored, those he guided toward a career in cinema, uh, television, and theater, and those who uh, wanted even more basically to learn to write clearly and effectively. He has supervised dozens uh, of independent studies in addition to his normal caseload, and uh, he worked one-on-one -on -one with a great many students for which he receives absolutely no extra compensation or relief from his regular teaching duties. Among the letters of support 
of his nomination are glowing tributes from former students, including some uh, who have or will become professional screenwriters, television scriptwriters, motion picture directors, and others in the entertainment field, all praising his energy, passion, practical knowledge, as well as his ability to inspire. One such former student began her letter by saying to the committee, and I'm quoting, it's hard to talk about Doug without sounding like some giddy fan. <laughs> Probably know who that is. <laughs> but even though teaching film production and narrative screenwriting can excite and inspire his students, Professor Heil believes that it's important to assist each of his students in pursuing that dream while simultaneously preparing them for alternative plan B, plan C, and plan D. Because as we all know, sometimes careers go in circuitous routes. This is the kind of practical mentoring and realistic prescience that is such an important part of the education of young people. Now also included in the materials that we reviewed was an example of his uh, critique of a student screenwriting project. And this was really interesting to me. He included it with the materials along with a comment that he still remembers his own frustrations as a student when his teacher would offer very little feedback on his essays, research pa papers, or creative writing, providing only comments such as, overall, very good, B+. He remembers wanting uh, so much to know so much more of what he could have done better, what parts of the written work uh, succeeded, what parts failed, and how he could improve uh, his writing. Uh, and this two and a half page sample critique that he gave us goes into great detail about where this student's film scene works and where it doesn't work. Um, here is an excerpt from the critique, and I'm reading from his critique. I found the flashback sequence confusing, although it is linked to a larger problem. You utilize, utilize several jumps in time, but there are no cues to help the viewer. On page four, you jump forward a week, but you script a straight cut to a new scene instead of a dissolve or wipe, um, which implies a passage of time. You do not cue the viewer with an explanatory title, and you do not have characters refer to the passage of time. It's my guess that this student's second draft that the scene was a whole lot better than the first one. <laughs> In his nomination of Professor Heil for this award, Oshkosh Provost and Vice Chancellor until recently, Lane Ernst. Oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Lane Ernst calls Professor Heil a tremendously energetic teacher with vision and charisma. He has produced a variety of scholarly works and developed an impressive array of grant resources that influences and that influence his teaching and his students' learning. He is a professional by every definition. His excellence is reflected not only in his achievements, but in the personal and professional success of his students. What better recommendation can a teacher have? Professor Heil, in recognition of your outstanding performance as a faculty member, at the Department of Communication at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, it is my pleasure to present to you the 2008 Regents Teaching Excellence Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm deeply honored to be chosen for this award and would like to express my gratitude to the Board of Regents, the UW System Office of Academic Affairs, and the Special Regents Award Committee. As a matter of fact, it took some time before I became a teacher. The years after my college graduation were a disaster. First, I was a piano salesman, but I got fired. I was an editorial assistant, but I got laid off. I tried to be a file clerk, but the work was so boring I quit. Then I was an admissions clerk, 
But again, I got fired. <laughs> During this period, my mother, who is right over there, <laughs> Uh, more than one said to me, have you thought about teaching? I think you'd be good at it. I always <laughs> raised her off <laughs> every single time. Finally, my parents threw me a lifeline. They said, if it would help, they would support graduate school. I seized that lifeline. <laughs> Near the end of my very first year, Professor Dana Hodgson told me I would be his teaching assistant in the fall. This was a remarkable opportunity. So how did I respond? With astounding cluelessness, I said, thanks, but uh, no thanks. I just want to be a filmmaker. I'll never forget the look on his face. After a very, very long pause, he finally shot back, well, too bad. I need a TA. I picked you, and you will be my TA. <laughs> so I became a TA. <laughs> And it was a life-changing moment. I will always be grateful to Professor Hodgson. What I didn't understand back then was how rewarding teaching could be. It entails problem solving, strategic planning, and unfettered creativity. Best of all, it is a profession through which fulfillment is tied to helping others. I would like to share two educational convictions. The first one I discovered early. When, when I was an undergrad, I wrote a novelette that my teacher absolutely dismissed. He had not one positive thing to say about any of its 100 pages, and the experience devastated me. In 1987, my first year at UW Oshkosh, I made the exact same mistake. Go figure. I zealously dissected a student TV script in class showing why it didn't work. When I finally looked back at the student, whom I perceived as a confident guy, I saw tears were rolling down his face. A short time later, I made a different mistake. After heaping praise on a script, the student author flagged me down after class and told me she was disappointed. Why's that? I said. You had nothing but praise. That's the problem, she said. If you only give praise, how do I improve? In time, I realized that almost every upper-level undergraduate project couples strengths with limitations. In providing feedback, I learned we must always strike a balance between encouragement and challenge. Give each student something to build on and take pride in, but also push the student to do even better. It's simple in theory, but so difficult to execute in practice. The second conviction I would like to share with you pertains to pedagogical goals. I was hired to teach students how to become filmmakers and scriptwriters. But the longer I teach, the more aware I am of the many graduates who end up in careers outside our field. I suspect this is not uncommon. Not every biology major <coughs> becomes a biologist. Not every psychology major becomes a psychologist. Over the years, I have adjusted my goals. While I still prepare students for the industry, I feel an equal mandate to help cultivate better writing and public speaking skills, skills that will enhance any career, whether inside or outside of the industry. This entails crawling down into the trenches and helping students with the minutia of cobbling words together. <coughs> the current emphasis on rubrics in our profession is good, in that a rubric clearly lays out expectations for an assignment and it precisely reveals why the student got the grade he or she received. But feedback should not end with the rubric. A rubric does not show how to craft words in a more compelling way. If, for an example, a student writes, Mary quickly bolts from the kitchen, the student needs to know the adverb quickly is redundant. You can't Bolt, slowly. <laughs> if someone writes, she stares at him in the face while he stands in the center of the room, she needs to learn that her sentence has been robbed of impact by stringing together five successive prepositional phrases. Editing the sentence down to, she stares at him, quadruples its impact. Help is also needed in differentiating between punctuation options. A colon, for example, has a more pronounced pause than a semicolon, so it delivers a bigger dramatic kick. Effective communication pivots 
on these distinctions. I could not have become a recipient of this award without the extraordinary support I received from my colleagues, Kay Neal, Tony Palmieri, Joe Gemin, Grace Lim, and the Distinguished Teaching Award Committee at UW Oshkosh. I am also very indebted to Chancellor Richard Wells, Provost Lane Earns, and Letters and Science Dean John Coker, who's also won this award, incidentally. Um, I'm very indebted for their generosity and encouragement. On a more personal level, I cannot tell you how happy I am that my parents have come from Illinois today to share this honor with me. Uh, I needed that lifeline and everything else you've given me in, in my over, my 50, let's be honest, 54 years. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I love you very much. Finally, the limitless patience and limitless love of my daughter Stephanie and my son Stephen and my wife Diane have provided me the most bracing, wonderful sustenance enabling me to conduct the close analyses and thorough responses I believe student work deserves. Thank you very much. very pleased um, to present our next individual Regents Teaching Excellence Award to Professor Nate Splett, Associate Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences and Professor of Agriculture, Ec Agricultural Economics at the University of Wisconsin River Falls. A warm welcome and congratulations to all family members, supporters and colleagues who are here today as we celebrate Dr. Splett's significant contribution to higher education in Wisconsin, and especially his tireless um, attention to student success. It is a special honor to serve on the selection committee for these Teaching Excellence Awards because it gives us a unique and compelling picture of the education that daily marks the value of the UW system to individual students, to the advancement of the state, and to the furthering of thought. Teaching is no simple task, and it is hard, hard to fully fathom the impact a professor and a mentor can have on a student. Thinking back about mentors who stand out in our own minds, I'm sure that we can all find a handful of people who really shaped the direction we took in our lives, and that, that sticks with a person and, and encourages them to, to go farther and, and challenge themselves. Um, Professor Splett received his bachelor's and master's degrees at River Falls and then um, attained his, his doctorate at the University of Illinois. He has mentored many young people in, in his career as an educator with UW Extension, then as a professor of agricultural economics at the University of Wisconsin River Falls, and now in his role as associate dean. Um, he's also received many numerous teaching awards um, both at the institution and from um, professional organizations dealing with his craft. I have a quote here from a student of his, um, Michael Brenner, maybe it's not a student, someone from the community at River Falls, um, who says, it seemed like without trying, Nate was able to keep the attention of all students at all times. When time had expired for the day, everyone was left yearning for more. Somehow, the minutes seemed to take by faster in his classes than in others. And I'd like to remind you all that these are economics classes. <laughs> in fact, I am currently enrolled in an, in an economics class, and I was wondering maybe if you could give me some <laughs> mentoring after our ceremony. Um, he makes economics relevant to students, and um, again, these students may not have the world's greatest aptitude for, for the subject, but it will advance their careers and help them in their work as they go out into the world, which is very admirable. Our committee was especially taken with the way Professor Splett articulated his philosophy and approach to teaching. He says, my credo is students teaching purpose. 
always for the students, always I teach to the best of my ability, always so that our graduates might fulfill their greater purpose. My challenge to students is to meet their greater purpose as the caretakers and shapers of our humanity, environment, and ideals. This is my passion, and I remain humble in living it. What an excellent statement. Cultivating a sense of professional and civic purpose is one of the most significant mo um, moments of a student's education. Dr. Splett is renowned for his mentoring. In the words of recently departed Chancellor Don Betts, third quote, Dr. Splett brings a wealth of personal experience to the classroom and strives to balance theory with real world applications. Students past and present appreciate the emphasis he places on teaching them to think critically and to apply themselves to the best of their abilities, engaging them both in and out of the classroom. His guidance and assistance does not end with their time at UW-River Falls, but extends beyond into their lives and occupations after college. Many consider him a true mentor and invaluable resource. In honor of your years of deliberate and distinguished service to the students of the University of Wisconsin system, it is my great honor to give you, to present to you the next Teaching Excellence Award. Thank you, Regent Thomas. <laughs> Kent Myers, in his book, The Witness of Combines, talks about fall plowing. One fall, I stood with Dad just after we'd finished fall plowing, looking over the blackened land. I felt great satisfaction having the job done, and I said so. <clears throat> yes, Dad replied, but it's no good. I didn't understand. I thought having the work done was an automatic good. <clears throat> Excuse me. He must have seen my confusion. All that soil turned to the wind all winter. It erodes. We really shouldn't plow in the fall. But I really don't know what to do about it. He silenced me. With the comment he made, Dad changed not only the way I looked at the land, but the way I looked at him. I thought he was a farmer whose mind was on farming and the tasks he had to do in order to do them. I discovered suddenly that he was a thinker, a reflector a wanderer, a worrier, who thought not only of the present, but of the future, even the future beyond his life and of how the things he did affected that future world. It surprised me to realize that he carried such thoughts, an undercurrent of debate within himself about his relationship to what he did and owned. All the time he was feeding cattle or pulling weeds or driving a tractor up and down the fields. This could easily be my own story. And because of it, and in turn, I think I understand. And I realize and I, I, I admire our students as they begin to write their own stories as the thinkers, the reflectors, the wanderers, the worriers about the future world. And I have the privilege to be their teacher. And when they graduate, as Regent Thomas says, they become the caretakers and the shapers of our humanity, our land, and our ideals. And so not only with the privilege, I have the responsibility to teach them as best I can. This award is testimony to you, Regents, for your commitment and dedication as the thinkers, the reflectors, the worriers of our UW system. I appreciate and I applaud each of you through your special skills and talents, be it administration, leadership, management, education, finance, planning, for your service in fulfilling the mission of our university to help students learn. But in particular, I thank you for keeping teaching excellence as the centerpiece, the greater purpose of our UW system. This is a special day moment for my wife, Becky, having recently retired after 30-some years of teaching, and for me to be here today to receive this recognition. 
I had the privilege to share a few remarks with our graduates, and it was there that I had the opportunity to reflect upon the importance of teaching at UW-River Falls and throughout our UW system. And it was there that, as I echo again, as Regent Thomas said, my credo, students teaching purpose, always for the students, always we teach to the best of our ability, always that our graduates might go out to fulfill their greater purpose. Our university mission is to help our students learn, and that means our mission as teaching faculty and teaching staff is to teach to the best of our ability. Our students expect this of us, and I see our faculty and staff fulfilling this mission at UWRF, at UW-Richland, across our entire state as a Wisconsin campus, and it is a privilege to be a teacher among them. Thank you very much. Um, to present the third and final award, and it is the department award being presented to the Department of Math, Statistics, and Computer Science at the University of Wisconsin Stout. This department enthusiastically and strongly promotes the philosophy of hands-on, minds-on learning, effectively using technology to enhance teaching and learning. And one of the things that really truly impressed the committee was when we discovered that um, after identifying a problem with respect to lower level math um, grades and, and le lower level math courses, the fac faculty collectively and collaboratively, you know that word, right? Okay, you got that, Jeff. Okay. Um, effectively improved student learning in lower level math courses and therefore aided in the retention of first year students. Failure and withdrawal rates dropped by an average of 55% in beginning algebra. Other statistics that, or, or impressive data, if you will, that we were just totally blown away by, the department received a 450,000 FIPSE FIPSI grant from the uh, U.S. Department of Education to study the impact on student retention and to expand the format to other courses and other schools throughout the state, in other words, replication. And since the fall of 2005, this department and its faculty have collaborated with industry to provide live projects for the students that provide actual software engineering experience. Companies such as Lockheed Martin and Thompson West, um, as examples, have participated in this by providing student projects uh, within uh, industry guidelines. And the list goes on in, in your materials. I, I want to say also that the faculty of this department have proven that they inspire the spirit of innovation in our students by, de de by demonstrating innovation themselves. I suspect that not only um, the students who are in the majors within this department, but also um, those pursuing um, their gen ed requirements, as taught by these professors, not only um, learn skills that, that allow them to apply their skills in their daily lives, but in the world beyond the classroom in their own neighborhoods, for example. And as a result, as the, as the students themselves attested, they're employed by some of the leading national companies in their fields. The students have written to us about um, what it means to have been taught by these professors, and I'll just quote a couple from them. Um, this was Ms. Boyd, and she said, this department is so great at teaching that internships just fall into our lap. <laughs> I've had many offers for actuarial scholarships and for IT positions as well. The math department has such great connections with its previous students who are out in the workforce and others who have not had the chance to attend Stout because the faculty teaches the students so well. We have our choice of jobs, which is an important factor in today's market. Another student um, said, I had the pleasure of having instructors who were not only up to date on the material, be of their interest in the field and attendance at professional learning events, but who also wanted to be better teachers. There are several research opportunities available to students, and I participated in a project to further the body of mathematics known as Lie Algebras. I don't know what that is, but 
I'm sure that student knows what that is. Uh, use my imagination. Maybe not. Okay. Um, this gave, gave me the ability to apply the material firsthand as well as further my knowledge of the fields taught to me. The students um, clearly benefited, but the impression that we were also left with is so have the faculty, both within the department and outside. So today we celebrate these professors who foster leadership by teaching what it means to lead. And as the students become involved in their learning, they energize their communities. The professors have sought most fundamentally to present new ways of teaching science and mathematics through formal lesson studies and the scholarship of teaching and learning, often referred to as SOTEL. I am very impressed that with, uh, with the way that these scholars, uh, scholar teachers frame their look at pedag uh, pedagogic, whatever that word is, issues, and how they seek new avenues to motivate students and help them succeed, among other things, through a tutorial, tutoring and science learning lab. Today, we uh, would like to recognize Professor Bendel and his colleagues, if you would stand. Um, and as examples of the tremendous work being done by so many professors throughout our system, but particularly on this campus. This is a small gesture for an enormously, but an enormously significant one because we want to say sincerely, thank you. So, your award. the Department of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science at UW-Stout. I'd like to thank the Board of Regents for selecting us for this award. It's a great honor for our department and for UW-Stout, and it's a privilege to accept this award for my colleagues, to some of them whom are here today, and the rest are back slaving away, so to speak, teaching our students while we're here. I'd also like to thank Regent Davis and the special committee that read the applications. Our department with three disciplines serves a wide variety of students, from students with poor math skills, to advanced mathematics and computer science students, and everything in between. Indeed, nearly every undergraduate student at Stout takes at least one class in our department, and many take several. I'm constantly amazed at the dedication my colleagues have for all of their students, no matter what their background. I see this day after day with their interactions with students in and out of the classroom. But it goes much deeper. They have a passion for improving and enhancing student learning. Individually, faculty and staff have attended numerous professional development events at Stout, regionally, and nationally. Many have done scholarly research on teaching and learning. For example, we've had several Wisconsin teaching fellows, such as Dr. Laura Schmidt and Dr. Diane Christie, both here today. Laura is a current fellow, and we're meeting tomorrow here in Madison with other fellows from throughout the state to talk about their projects. Other faculty have created new learning opportunities for students through undergraduate research experiences, independent study opportunities, and partnerships with industry. Beyond our individual efforts, much of our success is due, beyond our individual efforts, much of our success is due to the strong spirit of collaboration within the department. Many of our scholarly efforts have been in groups where faculty and staff can share ideas, resulting in improved learning in many classes. Informally, colleagues are always happy to share ideas with others and many meet regularly to discuss current issues and look for areas in need of improvement. It is this shared sense of mission that makes our department excel. The time permitted, I can say great things about each of my colleagues, but I would like to quickly recognize a few of them. Two are here today. Dr. Eileen Zito, my predecessor's chair, who laid much of the foundation for this award, and Dr. Diane Christie, who was program director of the Applied Mathematics and Computer Sciences Program, work to ensure that our curriculum is meeting the current needs of society. Two others were unable to attend. Dr. Jean Foley, the director of our Math Teaching and Learning Center, who as Regent Davis mentioned, has done an amazing job overseeing a transformation in how we teach our low-level mathematics courses. And Dr. Petri Genshu, who pushed us to apply for this award, did much of the work in preparing our application, and for the moment, thankfully, teaching my class in about a half an hour so that I could be here today. <laughs> 
This award recognizes not only the efforts of the instructional faculty and staff in the Department of Mathematics, Statistics, and Computer Science, but many other people at UW-Stout. Our Chancellor, Charles Sorensen, and Provost, Julie Ferspovi, who have supported the department in many ways. Our Dean for many years, John Murphy, who continually advocated for our department and worked with us to hire committed staff members. <coughs> our clerical staff, who interact frequently with students and help make our jobs easier and our student tutors and lab assistants who are equally passionate about helping their fellow students. When we heard that we had won this award, one of my colleagues said, now we need to do even better. As Stout develops new programs and grows in its role as Wisconsin's Polytechnic University, our department will be called upon even more to serve a wide array of students. It is this attitude within our department that will help us prepare students to meet the needs of Wisconsin in the 21st century. Thank you. I have one short announcement and then and I'm very excited about we have a new website that's devoted to all of our awards programs um, sponsored by the Board of Regents and while it's still under construction you can take a sneak peek um, which it will feature an online gallery of the current and past award recipients so just click on the UW Systems Board of Regents website um, and click on Region Awards and you're there for a wonderful um, virtual experience um, that allows you to, at your leisure, continue to celebrate our award recipients, both today and tomorrow. So I just want you to make sure you knew about that. And then I, I owe an apology. Um, I have to be back in Milwaukee for an event, so I won't be able to join you, but I'm hoping that everyone here will join our award recipients, their, their family, their colleagues, at a reception upstairs in the 19th floor that is, is immediately following this um, this uh, meeting. Thank meeting. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Anyhow, yeah, this meeting. So I think this meeting, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Well, Re Regent Davis, would you like to make a motion to adjourn this meeting? I still move. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, all in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you on the 19th floor. Good. 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 Good.